Tonight, we are on the air with members of the local Northwest Florida legislative delegation, and they want to know what's on your mind. We are live and interactive on radio and on television. From the Gene and Paul Amos Performance Studio, it's Legislative Review, Dialogue with the Delegation. This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Jeff Weeks. In addition to our television broadcast on WSRT, WSRE TV, we are also being heard on News Radio 92.3 FM and AM 1620. Well, a lot has happened since we last broadcast a legislative review in January of 2020. In the midst of the global pandemic, Northwest Florida experienced a major disruption, Hurricane Sally during which barges crashed into the newly constructed span of the Pensacola Bay Bridge, making it unusable until just recently. The incident caused major inconveniences and economic fallout. Meanwhile, in Tallahassee, COVID-19 and divisive politics were sure to make the 2021 legislative session one to remember. Controversy and distractions aside, the system still works and lawmakers did their job passing numerous bills and the largest budget in the Sunshine State's history. Governor Ron DeSantis signed the $101 billion budget yesterday. On tonight's program, we'll find out how Northwest Florida fared in the 2021 session. But we also want to hear from you and learn what is on your mind. This is a forum for you to speak directly to your legislative delegation. You can do so by email or phone. The email address is questions at WSRE.org, or if you prefer, you can give us a call at 850-484-1223 or toll free at 1-800-239-WSRE. We are joined by members of the Northwest Florida Legislative Delegation. Senator Doug Broxson serves District 1. He is chair of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Education, vice chair on the Banking and Insurance Committee, as well as serving on education, appropriations, ethics, and elections, judiciary, and several others. District 2 Senator George Gaynor was unable to join us this evening. He is chair of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Transportation, Tourism, and Economic Development. From the Florida House of Representatives, Jayer Williamson serves House District 3. Representative Williamson is chair of the Infrastructure and Tourism Appropriations Subcommittee. His other committee assignments include appropriations, rules, and pandemics and public emergencies. Alex Andrade serves House District 2. Representative Andrade is a Republican committee whip and serves on the Education and Employment Committee, Professions and Public Health Subcommittee, and the Pre-K through 12 Appropriations Subcommittee. Pat Maney serves District 4. Representative Maney uh, was elected in 2020, taking the spot left vacant by Mel Ponder. Representative Maney was unable to join us this evening. His committee assignments include education and employment and the criminal justice and public safety. He's on the, the, uh, that subcommittee. Not since 2006, when Holly Benson held the District 3 seat as Northwest Florida delegation had a female member. But in 2020, Michelle Salzman changed all that, defeating Republican Mike Hill and Democratic challenger Francine Mathis. Michelle Salzman represents House District 1. Representative Salzman is on the Judiciary Committee, Local Administration, or I should say Administration and Veterans Affairs Subcommittee, and the Post-Secondary Education and Lifelong Learning Subcommittee. Lady and gentlemen, welcome. That was a lot to get out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. You know, it's hard to believe we last gathered here January 2020, and we usually do these a couple of times a year, but because of COVID, we're unable to do so. A lot has changed. Senator Brox and I usually begin with you and just start off by asking you, give me kind of the 10,000 foot view of how you, your take on the 2021 legislative session. Strange. <laughs> uh, it's very unusual not to see the Capitol full of people that are interacting with the legislative process. And frankly, in the Senate, uh, we imposed a rule that says no one except staff and senators could be uh, in the building. The House had a different approach, but uh, it's nothing 
that any of our senators enjoyed. We like people. That's the reason we're in right. politics. And to be separated from those people we represent was very, very painful. And hopefully uh, we'll get back to normal very soon. Yeah. How about you, Representative Williamson? Sure, there was a lot of unknowns going into uh, this session, um, whether it be protocols in the House and the Senate, uh, but we still had to do the business of the state and the business for the people of the state of Florida. So I think, uh, you know, we have one job we have to do every time we go to Tallahassee, and that's that we come back with a balanced budget. We did that, and it's a, it was a good budget for the state of Florida and a great budget for Northwest Florida, and we're going to talk about that tonight. Sounds good. Representative Andrade? Uh, uh, tailing off what Senator Broxton and uh, Chair Williamson just said, uh, it was uh, just the, the theme was unknowns. Um, throughout session, uh, we had shifting CDC protocols throughout. Going into session, we weren't exactly sure who was going to be allowed in the building. We absolutely had no idea what our budget was going to look like. Uh, so to you know, ride out through session week through week, we all got tested at least two times every week before we were allowed in the Capitol uh, for COVID-19. Um, you know, just it was it was a very different uh, session, kind of navigating all those unknowns. Representative Salzman, you picked a great year to start. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I did, actually. Um, I, I don't know what to compare it to, but I, I certainly think that the theme was COVID, uh, whether it be the budget reflective of COVID or the way we operate in the Capitol reflective of COVID. And, of course, our initial priorities in the House was passing the COVID liability legislation. So um, certainly COVID was on everybody's mind, especially those two tests per week yeah. <laughs> and, the, and the 12 to 15 hour days wearing the face masks. But um, it, it was a lot of fun and, and we certainly got some good stuff done for Florida. Wonderful. Well, welcome. Nice to have you with us. Well, Senator Broxson, let me begin with you. Let's talk about what happened here locally. Pretty, pretty good year for Northwest Florida from what I can, what I can tell. What are you most proud of? First year in my memory of 11 years serving that we did not have one veto project. And uh, that certainly was important to our college systems, our university, and to every part of what makes Northwest Florida unique part of the, the state. So we're, we're very proud. We worked as a team and uh, we're able to bring it together at the end of session. And uh, of course we had the stimulus. We had three stimuluses that came from Washington uh, much of that money went directly to the administration or to the school systems, both uh, K through 12 and universities. And frankly, it was a big challenge for Florida that's very independent, very budget conscious to see that kind of money flow into Florida that uh, challenges our, our principles. Representative Williamson, what are you most proud of bringing home the bacon, so to speak? Right. When you look at uh, local projects and within my district, two projects for the town of Jay, $300,000 uh, for the town of uh, Jay, Bray Hendricks Parks uh, project. We had $250,000 for a well pump in the town of Jay. Two projects in the city of Milton were also funded, and we had projects in Santa Rosa County that were funded as well. Um, and that's not just simply because of me doing work. That's because of all the people sitting at this table. People talk about politics and look at politics as an indiv individual sport. Uh, when you're in the legislature, it truly is a team sport. And it's before you file bills, making sure that they're in proper posture, making sure you work the bills through the process. And then afterwards, once those bills pass through the legislature and get into the budget, work in the governor's office to make sure they know the importance to those projects back home. I'm very proud of the individuals that are sitting up here with at the table. I could not do it without them, and I hope they would say the, the same thing. But we had a really good day uh, this week uh, when the budget uh, was signed and the governor really committed to Northwest Florida, and we're very thankful for that. Yeah. Representative Andrade. Uh, well, uh, just kind of dovetailing off of what the two gentlemen before me have already said, I made a joke earlier uh, during session that the town of Jay should probably change their name to the town of Jer uh, <laughs> uh, because they had such a good budget year uh, on the transportation side. But no, uh, I would say that in my first two legislative sessions in 2019 and 2020, um, you know, I was very proud to get work with Senator Broxton and get 10 projects funded that first year and then 11 projects funded that second year. But both years, uh, you know, the governor vetoed about half. Um, you know, I, I ended up having six in both years. Um, and uh, that means you have to make some tough phone calls back home and say, hey, the work that we've done to date uh, is, is not coming this year for whatever reason. Um, so to have, um, you know, 14 projects, I think I, I worked uh, 13 of those 14 with Senator Broxton. Um, don't only have two of those vetoed and neither of those actually affecting our district. Uh, our, our community, um, it was just a relief not to have to make those bad phone calls. And there's going to be a lot of community organizations and, and programs here in, in the district and in Northwest Florida that are going to benefit from that money. So I'm just, 
I'm more relieved than anything else and uh, excited to, to be able to show that support back home. Good deal. Representative Salzman? Well, I'm, I'm just excited. Uh, all of my projects were funded, and um, when we came into this legislative session, I remember having meetings with uh, Jair and, and him telling me, Representative Williamson, sorry, telling me that, uh, you know, just be mindful. We don't really know what the budget's going to look like. We're going to try to fight for you. You know, we're working together, and um, so I didn't really know what we were going to get. Uh, I, I think that everybody up here just working together and really just trying to make sure that we're all moving in the same direction certainly helped uh, being on the same page with a majority of our projects being uh, something that the state's priorities are with water and infrastructure and education I think that it, it made it a little bit easier but I'm certainly proud of finally getting the bluffs across the finish line that was a two and a half million dollar project that was fully funded in the ask and then Another thing that I'm really excited about is getting Century some, some money for their uh, well project that they have um, coming into the legislative session. We talked about how uh, it might be difficult to get them some money based off of historical things that, that were going on. And so we were a little creative in the ask and went through the um, county commissioners and asked them to manage that money. And that was obviously partnership with Senator Roxon and his staff certainly would have never made uh, across the finish line and, and I probably wouldn't have even known how to even create a project like that if it wasn't for him and his staff but um, I'm looking forward to continuing that process of, of getting more funds for Century and just really trying to develop that that part of my district because it's one of those that don't bring in enough tax revenue to take care of their own infrastructure so we only, we're only as strong as our weakest link not that Century is weak but certainly weak in the tax revenue and I want to make sure that we take care of them. And a lot of growth in your district Yes, uh, it seems, seems that way. We have many questions that have been emailed in or phoned in from viewers and listeners and we would like you to continue to do so. You can uh, dial in at 850-484-1223 or 1-800-239-WSRE and one of our producers will take your question down and they will get it out to me or if it's easier for you just simply send your question to questions at wsre.org. That's questions at wsre.org. Well, Senator Broxson, let me begin with you on this, and you knew this one had to be coming, that little bridge over there that caused so much trouble. One of our viewers wants to know what assurances has Skanska offered regarding the current hurricane season? Will they do a better job of securing their barges in the event of a hurricane? We can only hope so. <laughs> I don't think anybody, uh, if you live that side of the bridge or you work on the beach, it was a nightmare for eight months. Uh, Skanska certainly was embarrassed by what happened and uh, I guess the federal judge will make a decision on whether there is an, any third party liability. We know they have some direct liability that uh, they're taking care of but uh, I, I, I say it and I hate to say this but it will be the only bridge ever built in Florida where the contractor won't be at the ribbon cutting. Yeah. Uh, the the uh, the animosity towards them is just unparalleled and uh, you always hate to see that because they're good people that work out there. Somebody or something uh, created a circumstance where they did not move 27 barges and we know the result and now we're back to almost normal within a month. We hope to be in four lanes and by the end of the summer next year we'll be at the full two bridge span. So uh, it's, it's been very challenging and working with DOT uh, and not dealing with the litigation, but dealing with the operation, working with the governor's office, which we have to applaud him. Each 30 days, he renewed the suspension of the toll on Garcon Point Bridge. 35,000 cars went through that free, and we hope to continue that through June until we get to four lanes, and then we'll deal with the consequences of all of this after uh, probably into the fall. Let me ask you about that, the Garson Point Bridge. How will that ultimately be squared up? I mean, clearly they missed out on a lot of revenue. Not that they would have had that kind of revenue had it not been for that, but nonetheless, I mean, people went over for free for a long, long time. How Will, will that ever be made whole? Or Well, in, in the document that uh, controls the operation of the bridge, if there is an emergency declared, uh, it, it uh, delays the payment until the legislature can meet and then either... Uh, uh, Representative Williamson or I or both would present a bill to the legislature requesting reimbursement. But listen, 
Uh, we've got a lot of questions for them, and I'm sure they have questions for us. We would like to eventually see the people of Florida on that bridge and uh, let them get out of the bridge business. And I believe that uh, Representative Williamson and I are going to be working to, uh, and, and Representative Andrade, to, to see if we can take some of the money that came down from the feds and negotiate a settlement. And whether that happens is really not our decision. It's privately owned. And uh, we'll see if they're willing to talk to us. They certainly are going to want to be reimbursed for the probably $30 million of revenue they lost. And uh, we want a longer conversation about the future of that bridge before we present those bills. It, it kind of explain for those who don't know who actually owns that bridge. This bridge is a special district that was formed by the legislature in the early 90s. Uh, it was privately funded based on a feasibility study very similar to the one that they did with the Mid-Bay Bridge in, uh, in Niceville. Uh, frankly, the study was defective and the projections uh, were not correct and the bridge went into default in uh, around 2008. Now, they, the, this is strange. They do not own the bridge. They own the revenue. And the document guarantees them under any conditions they will always have the revenue until the bridge is paid off. So it is a complicated formula. Uh, it is one of the most challenging documents to navigate through, both for the department <clears throat> and for people of this area. Uh, I can tell you this, that when that toll goes back up, goes back on the people's back, a $5 per car, and if you have more than two axles, it's $5 per axle, you're going to see a lot more traffic going over the Pensacola Bay Bridge. There is still a lot of resentment towards uh, the insensitivity of the owners of that bridge concerning the people that live in both the north end and the south end of Santa Rosa County. And so the, the end goal, goal would ultimately be that the state of Florida would own that at some point? Well, or Representative Williamson and I actually presented a bill a couple years ago and uh, hoped to have some buy-in from the from the uh, bondholders. We did not get the message that we were looking for, and unfortunately, that bill died uh, and was never part of the a bill that the governor could sign. Uh, we, we think there's an opportunity here to revisit the issue, and I'm sure Representative Williamson has comments that he has on it, but uh, we, we're concerned. We found out how valuable that bridge is, yeah. and we know that during storm season that we need to have a route north off the peninsula. Right. And uh, so it's vital. I, I say this, uh, that if there's a feasibility study done today, I think it would justify DOT building a bridge. Right. So why can't we take that perspective and go back to them and say, we have a usable bridge to see if we can change ownership. Because there's been so much growth since that bridge was originally put up. So clearly, and you know, like you said, people need to get out of there in the event of a storm. Do you want to comment? Yeah, I don't think there's a day that goes by, definitely not a week that goes by that the center and I don't um, think about that bridge, unfortunately, and how do we fix it. Unfortunately, the revenues that are generated or have been generated in the past, they don't cover the operations and maintenance for the bridge. So the state simply waives that at the tune of one and a half million to two million dollars a year. Um, everybody says, why don't you just buy the bridge? Well, if you, ha if you want to buy a bridge, you also have to have a willing seller. Um, so I think that over the course of the next uh, year or two, we're going to continue to work on that. And, and we've tried in the past. It just hasn't gotten to the right spot uh, for the bondholders and for the trustee to be uh, willing to negotiate with us. We're going to keep pushing for that, and I'm committed to do that before I leave office. Very good. Would either of you like to comment on the bridge? Uh, which one? <laughs> <laughs> the, the Garcon <laughs> Point. And, um, and, and well, uh, well uh, going back to the, the question uh, posed to Senator Broxton about what assurances do we have from Skanska, first and foremost, they had a safety plan last year, right? Uh, the safety plan said if there was a storm in the Gulf, a named storm in the Gulf, they were supposed to move their barges out to East Bay. They did not do that. We have documents from DOT like, uh, saying that, uh, you know, and, and levying that on Skanska, saying they were in breach of their contract. So they are right now still in violation of their contract. They're getting assessed $35,000 a day in liquidated damages on the books. Um, and once the project is fully done, um, you know, that liquidated damages assessment, that calculation is going to have to be, you know, they're going to have to, to, to tee that up. We're, we're looking at 10 and, 10 and a half million uh, so far since September in liquidated damages alone. 
Um, so it, it's potentially not just federal funds that are coming down that could help us you know, make lemonade out of the lemons we've been served. Uh, it could potentially be some type of liquidated damages that the state is going to receive uh, off the contract amount. We still have $80 million on the $435 million contract to build Three Mile Bridge that the state currently possesses in our bank account. So it's not a matter of them writing us a check. It's a matter of, of, it's a matter of us withholding that payment um, and, and seeing what happens in litigation on the contract itself. I, I do anticipate um, that there will potentially be some type of dispute between Skanska and the state uh, once the contract is, once the project is fully complete, but um, barring some delay in litigation, um, you know, them settling up on, on the project amount itself, we should have additional funds going back to the Transportation Trust Fund that can be used to hopefully offset whatever uh, refinancing might have to occur to, to purchase that Garcon Point Bridge uh, from the bondholders. Um, but again, uh, you got two gentlemen to my right who've been dealing with this for far longer than I have. Um, and, it, and the issue ultimately is not just you're negotiating with bondholders who purchased bonds that weren't listed even as investable uh, at the time that they purchased those bonds, but you're dealing with a trustee uh, in, in bankruptcy court because that bridge has been in receivership since 2008. So um, there's some potential there. Um, and it's, you know, even though the bridge is back open, um, you know, the, the really the unique fun part begins now for forward thinking uh, you know, a forward-thinking team approach on, on how to hopefully make it better for our region in the future. Yeah. Representative Salzman, comment? Well, I would just echo what all the gentlemen have set up here. I think that um, buying the bridge is certainly a smart move and not, not a new idea, but maybe the opportunity now is to revisit that. And <clears throat> certainly we need, we need the bridge. We need that additional way back and forth. So um, I fully support what these gentlemen do and, and we'll be running in the same direction. Great, great. Okay, let's run through some other uh, topics from our viewers. Uh, police reform. How would you assess the legislature's efforts in regard to police reform this year? Please describe the scope and details of that legislation. And I'll throw that up for, for jump ball here. Who wants to comment to begin with? I mean, Nobody jump at once, guys. But, um, <laughs> no, uh, I, we, we did have um, uh, one bill passed by uh, Chair Court Bird, who was the chair of our Criminal Justice Subcommittee in the House, um, you know, dealing with some concerns folks have about, uh, you know, overreaching uh, police officers. I, I would challenge somewhat the premise of the, the question, the fact that, uh, you know, a lot of the consternation we've seen in the public discourse is directly due to uh, simply, you know, bad acting police officers. The bottom line is we need to make sure that uh, police officers are fully trained. Uh, and we also need to need to recognize the fact that our law enforcement officers in the state of Florida are underfunded. Um, so I'm very excited for the fact that this year in our budget, uh, we're giving bonuses to all law enforcement officers in the state, uh, public safety officers. Um, you know, we're recommitting to that training process that we discussed. Um, and we also stood fast in, in House Bill 1 and said, no, you will not defund our police departments here in Florida. Um, because we've seen examples around the country to date now, and some cities that, that went that route are now calling for more police officer presence um, because they've seen the effects of reduction in police officer presence. So um, this isn't a, a one-size-fits-all approach. This isn't a, a uh, I, I do not ascribe to vilifying an entire honorable profession like we've seen a lot in the past year. Um, but supporting our police officers with the finances, putting our money where our mouth is, uh, you know, you have Sheriff Bob Johnson in Santa Rosa County committing to having body cameras on all his uh, uh, deputies uh, in the very near future. Those are good steps. Um, a focus on training is absolutely a good step as well. So I hope that was specific enough for the, the person asking the question, uh, even if I might not agree with necessarily the premise or where they were coming from. Jeff, let me just add to that. We, we've made a strong commitment that we're going to protect our police when they're doing their job. And we want people to uh, peacefully uh, uh, have protests, that's fine. We think that you should do it without destroying someone's property or public property. And we sent a clear statement. This is in no way discouraging people from doing what they can do constitutionally. And we believe that the bill that we pass will uh, pass the, the muster as far as the court's ruling that we made good public uh, decisions that will help 
people navigate through the next few years. You're talking about the anti-rioting? Yes. I expand a little bit on, on what that's all about, because that has been something that's been rather controversial. It's been in the press a lot. Talk a little bit about that bill, and I'll, whoever wants to jump in to begin with. Well, I just want to add, to to Representative Andrade what he said about Cord Bird's bill. Um, also, that was a bipartisanship bill, that there was a seat at the table with uh, the whole Democrat caucus, and I think one of the co-sponsors on that bill was Tracy Davis out of Jacksonville. Uh, the, the minority leader uh, was also very um, instrumental in having that legislation passed. It was a bill that the whole chamber supported Democrats and Republicans to make sure we have some reforms in place to protect people in their, in their communities. Um, obviously, we want to make sure that any profession that we have, you're going to have bad apples. You have it in law enforcement. You have it in all things. We're going to support law enforcement in the state of Florida, but we're also going to realize that whatever profession you have, you may have people that overstep a boundary, and we're going to make sure that it doesn't happen in our state. So I, I just wanted to be clear that that bill was supported by all people in the chamber and in the House. That was not HB1. That was not HB1. <laughs> right. I'm talking about the uh, Cord Bird's bill. Exactly. So, so going back to the anti-rioting. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, um, uh, Cord Bird's bill, Chair Bird's bill was a highly touted uh, bipartisan, by, by a bipartisan majority of the Florida House. House Bill 1 uh, and the alternative, um, you know, is in response to something that uh, I think I've personally experienced for the past two years since I've been in elected office as a Republican. Um, the same folks that for my first year and a half were saying my speech was violence suddenly turned around and were saying their violence was speech. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's a schism in the United States about what constitutes free speech, what constitutes free expression, what should be allowed um, in America under the First Amendment. And uh, I see HB1 as a, as a course correction in reasserting that the First Amendment stands for the right to peaceful protest. Um, uh, you don't get to uh, harm uh, another individual person. You don't get to damage someone's private property. You don't get to loot. You don't get to damage buildings. You don't get to go um, and call for the burning down of police precincts uh, and call it free speech because it's not. It's violence. Um, and while I can, I can recognize the, 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 the angst and anger folks felt uh, in response uh, to the death of George Floyd, and I, I don't believe there was a single politician in America, Republican or Democrat, who did not denounce George Floyd's death as a murder, as a, a fundamentally un-American murder um, from President Trump on down. Um, when the response to that is, is saying that the First Amendment should pr protect a, a brick being thrown at a police officer, we're, we're going to have a difference of opinion. Uh, and I believe the Constitution is going to err uh, on our side on that one, uh, you know, the folks that supported House Bill 1. Right. So, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, it, sorry, just to reassert, the First Amendment stands for one thing, um, and damaging private property and attacking police officers is not protected by the First Amendment. Very good. And, and I don't think anybody that sits at this table or, or anybody across the state of Florida says that people can't peacefully protest. There's a difference between a protest and a riot. Burning down buildings, burning down people's property, that is not a protest. That is a riot. There was also cyber intimidation um, aspects to that bill um, that are important. When we look at uh, Facebook and these other things that we're using to make sure people aren't intimidated um, um, through, uh, through social media. Uh, but a protest is a protest. People can peacefully protest. Whether I agree with what they're protesting on or not, they have that right. You don't have the right to, r to run around and burn down buildings and burn down people's property. Representative Salzman, any commentary on it? No, I think they summed it up. Very good. Let's talk a little bit about um, alimony reform. That came up, seems like it comes up every year. <laughs> we, Let's we, talk we, about we, alimony reform. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, uh, it, it, it seemed to be a little bigger deal this year than perhaps it has been in the past few years. Um, you would like to address, who would like to? Well, it was Representative Andrade, who was a prime co. I think he'd be a good person yeah, to speak to it. Start with, start with you. What, what, what happened there? What, what, what was it all about? What was the deal? Uh, so Florida is one of six states in the country that still allows for permanent alimony, which means that a judge can, uh, regardless of the length of time that you've been, uh, you were married uh, to another individual, the judge can assign you uh, what's called permanent alimony, meaning you have to make monthly payments to your ex-spouse. Um, and if you ever want to retire, you have to ask that judge's permission. And if your ex-spouse happens not to like you, uh, which I think statistically is probably the case, um, <laughs> you may actually have to go through litigation um, to get a judge to sign off and allowing you to retire with dignity and to stop having to work to, to make these monthly payments. 
Um, the, the whole structure of alimony in the state of Florida and the debate around alimony in the state of Florida disregards the fact that at the outset of a divorce, you split all of your worldly assets that you accumulated during that marriage 50-50 at least. Uh, and most likely erring in the benefit of whichever spouse may not have, you know, gone and earned an income or, you know, increased their, their professional uh, acumen during the marriage because of the sacrifices and recognition of what they did during that marriage. Um, uh, it's, it, it, it's the type of bill that tends to put people in two different corners um, and really pegs people in two different stereotypes. But um, I did run a, a bill last year to allow people to retire with dignity. It passed through the House. It didn't move in the Senate. Uh, this year there were some, some signs that the Senate was willing to consider it. Um, unfortunately, towards the end of session, after it had passed in two committees in the Senate, um, uh, it died in the third committee in the Senate. So it did move farther. Um, uh, but ultimately, in the state of Florida right now, we have uh, a system that incentivizes litigation. And I don't think the, the folks at home really understand how much litigation costs. Um, you're talking about spending fifty to $150,000 potentially arguing over a $2,000 a month payment. Um, you have folks that are willing to burn down their net assets in the process. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it's anti-consumer. It hurts the family. It has nothing to do with child support or child custody. Um, alimony doesn't. Uh, the bill itself did contain a 50-50 child sharing presumption. Um, and that largely came about because of the instances that we heard where you had one spouse saying, I won't challenge this alimony payment. Um, I won't challenge child custody if you give me the vacation home. Um, and it, was, it, was, it, it resulted in a visceral response from a lot of people. If you, if you hear of these stories where children are being treated on the same level as vacation homes and vehicles, um, it, it did drive people to want to keep that provision in. I believe that provision does probably prevent the overall arching alimony reform component of passing, um, but I think there is a middle ground that can probably be reached in the future. Anyone else like to comment on that? Well, I'll tell you that uh, it was the most passionate testimony on both sides. You'd have testimony from people that uh, believe the system uh, solves their issues, and then the people on the other side, it was destroying their life. Anytime you depend on a law to create uh, a satisfaction in human conditions, uh, we can't do it. Uh, w something needs to be done. We haven't find, found the, uh, uh, the middle point. Mm -hmm. And hopefully in future years we can because there are people that uh, are being mistreated on both sides. Mm -hmm. And hopefully uh, somebody will have uh, some Old Testament uh, character show up in the legislature that will be able to split the baby and give us uh, a, a bill that makes sense. <laughs> you, uh, I, I think um, I, I just personally consider alimony as a form of welfare. So I'm, I'm not a fan of alimony. Um, I, I certainly support alimony reform. My biggest qualm with the current bill, the way it was written, was the 50-50 um, custody issue that, that was placed in there. And I do understand the reasoning behind it, but as a mom of three children and a divorcee and a PTA mom who spends a lot of time with children and families, especially those that have needs, and are seeking, you know, advice and, and how to structure their lives as they go through these changes. The number one thing that men have had a hard time overcoming in the past several decades is being able to see their child without having a dollar sign waved over their head. And not that the reform with adding the 50-50 was a bad idea. For me, fundamentally, the reason why I didn't carry the bill, because I was asked to carry the bill, was that one component. Not that it doesn't need to be addressed, but when you start talking about child custody and alimony in the same bill, it just muddies the water. I, I certainly would love to help get rid of alimony in, in the state of Florida. I really don't agree with I, maybe a temporary, you know, I liked a lot of the language that was in the bill that was presented. I really liked the thought that went in, into it on, you know, how we would address it and, and, and um, analyze like how long you were there and were you disabled and what did you do in the home. I love that. They put a lot of thought into that. But Certainly, um, when you mix those two together, it creates a really hard conversation. I think that was a lot of the opposition that I had heard when I was talking to 
families about you know the alimony reform bill there there was opposition on the other end that said I've been receiving alimony for my whole life I get you know I get five thousand dollars a month for 10 15 years now and now you're gonna take it away from me and my first thought not trying to be insensitive is if you've gotten five to ten thousand dollars a month for 10 to 15 years now what have you been doing with your money to the point where you you absolutely have to have that for the rest of your life if I was getting that kind of money and I was sitting at home I would go find another career I would find a way to become self-sustaining to where I'm not on that welfare system. Not that I'm not allowed to have it by law, but is it really ethical to live that way? So I, I, liked, I liked a lot about the bill. I, I certainly think that we do need to reform alimony. I'm, I'm willing to be a huge champion with that um, concept, but in this case with that 50-50 child share thing, I really just... I, I didn't like that. I did vote yes on it because I, I have this thing where if, if I like most of the bill, I'm absolutely in. I mean, if I could get 100% of what I wanted, I'm not in the right field. You know, we're supposed to be in a world of give and take where we settle for, you know, a majority of what looks good. And in that case, I felt like the bill was good enough certainly to vote for it and, and pass on the floor if possible. But um, I, I, think, I think there's a lot to be said about that conversation, and I, I think um, championing, championing that bill and, and pushing it forward two years in a row and getting further each time, I think that really shows that there is a need for something in, in Florida. Very good. Any other commentary on that, or shall we move on? It's been talked to death. So I know. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Let's move on. Here's a kind of an interesting um, question. Um, makes a lot of sense. A uh, gentleman uh, writes in and says, transfer upon death slash deeds and titles. Uh, do you plan to introduce or support legislation to provide for transfer upon death of real estate deeds and vehicle titles? He says the option is now available for real estate in at least 28 states and the District of Columbia and for vehicles in 19 states. Um, and his commentary is it greatly eases the burden on bereaved families. Any, any thoughts on that? This is a new one. This is a yeah. unique yeah. one. Thank you for the question. I would uh, I would say first and foremost, uh, you know, from the legal component, from the legal standpoint, um, uh, some type of automatic transfer. Um, it, it can make sense in theory, but when you get down to the weeds on a uh, chain of title, um, you know, here in Northwest Florida, we have a lot of different issues. Um, we have people that die intestate. So if you die intestate, meaning you don't have a will, and there's, there's no direct spouse or, or specific person that can be delineated that's obvious, who do you transfer that property to? Who do you transfer that vehicle to? Uh, we have people, uh, uh, we have properties, plots of land in Northwest Florida that are owned by potentially 30 different family members right now because of how many generations have died intestate. Um, and cleaning up that title has become a huge concern. Um, I'm more passionate about figuring out a more streamlined way to try and clear that title and make that property uh, economically feasible again because uh, I think it's going to empower a lot of people right now who don't have financial means to, to use that property um, or don't have the financial means to go hire a lawyer to clear that title themselves. Um, but uh, transferring property um, uh, you know, after someone passes away is absolutely something that can be looked at. Um, it's just I'd have to go look at what those other states have done to, to solve those concerns I have. I just wonder if he's thinking, uh, you know, similar to the way, say, a, an investment account would be or maybe a bank account where you can put a beneficiary on there if something mm -hmm. happens, you know. Um, that's a great question. So yes. uh, any other commentary on that? Maybe. <laughs> I don't think I can add any more than my attorney over here uh, <laughs> said about it. So, 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 so anyway, uh, Mr. Mr. Bosley from down in Valparaiso, great question there. Um, you know, we get this one every time we, we go on the air, but uh, why not? Let's throw it, at, throw it at you again. Is there any support for uh, d designing a state-administered recreational marijuana sales policy, or is it to be left to the voters? Uh, I would not support that. I think we don't even have the system right right now. Uh, currently, I mean, we're working through it, but we're only a few years into medical marijuana, and we still have so many kinks that, that I think we should be working through. Uh, I, don't, I just don't think we're there yet, and, and I know that my constituents, uh, I did a poll of my constituents, my voters, about four months ago, and I think it was 70% uh, or so. Um, of them said absolutely not to recreational marijuana and um, which falls in line with how I feel personally so I wouldn't support that. Any other well, we're, well, we're gonna, this 
none of these initiatives have been led by the legislature. They've all come through mm -hmm. constitutional amendments. And I can assure you there's going to be another constitutional amendment that pushes for exactly what that viewer wants to see. Uh, it will not be something we, we will vote on. It will be something we'll have to deal with. Wow. Okay. Yeah, and I think that's something you leave up to the vote of the people. And if the legislature has to implement it one day, then they do. I don't support it. Um, I think, you know, we've, we've said that medical marijuana, I've been a supporter of that from the very beginning. We're, we, if we say that, that you have an alternative medicine and we support that, I think the thing that we need to be looking at now after, after looking back over the last few years, let's look at employee protections for people who are medical card holders. Um, I think that would be what the legislature should be working on when it comes to marijuana in the future. Very good. A uh, question just came in. What environmental projects for Northwest Florida were passed and signed by the governor this session? I think uh, Representative Andrade and I had a estuary bill that uh, he was very passionate about and uh, presented it to me and we were able to get it across the line. Uh, we're, we've got some great opportunities, primarily in the bay, bays to uh, uh, to deal with uh, agriculture or, or water agriculture that uh, oysters and things that uh, I believe he's going to uh, champion that issue in the future and hopefully we'll get a bill across next session. Um, yeah, so uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, Senator Broxton and I for the second year in a row have gotten money for a program called the Pensacola Perdita Bay Estuary Program. Um, uh, this is a program that levied some uh, Restore Act funds after the BP oil spill uh, from the federal government with some state funds as well from last year to now this year um, to continue working through these uh, ways to clean up our, our legacy pollution here in Northwest Florida across the watershed of both Pensacola and Perdita Bay. Um, uh, this year, uh, Senator Broxton, I think I bugged him the most on trying to come up with a program through uh, IFAS, uh, the University of Florida's uh, Agriculture Department, um, to begin a research program on how to create uh, naturally occurring spat the, the seed that is used to start oysters, because we do have oyster farming operations here in Northwest Florida. Um, it got to me a little bit too late in session. I'd assigned IFAS a homework project. They came back to me with an incredible project, but a little bit too late in session for us to get it done. Um, uh, the, it, I mean, it was me personally just running around and uh, I couldn't quite get it done this year. Um, but I do think next year, it's a, it's a huge opportunity for Northwest Florida, especially with Apalachicola Bay's um, uh, wild caught oyster fisheries uh, being collapsed right now and still having uh, future moratoriums on it for, uh, you know, uh, Pensacola Bay, for East Bay, uh, to really take on the, the oyster farming industry and to, to create it into a, a, a stronger, more resilient industry for the future. I think aquaculture is the wave of the future. Um, it has dramatic benefits for water quality. Um, uh, I think also, just a funny note, I think Senator Broxton and I hold the record for the smallest appropriation awarded this year, uh, all $37,000 of it for a water runoff study um, for the shipyard in Bayou Chico. Okay. Um, so it holds a record for the smallest uh, appropriation <laughs> award, um, but it is another water project uh, that we were able to get through funded this year together. Very good. And I was just going to add the town of Jay. We have the water well that I spoke about earlier, $250,000 that the senator, senator and I worked on. We also had two projects in the city of Milton, $500,000 a piece, one for uh, Lachlan Lake and, and then one for the Milton Reclamation Center or the Santa Rosa Reclamation Center. When you look at the state of Florida, over $400 million that was um, put into land conservation, uh, $150 million that we had for beach renourishment and $50 million that we put to our state parks, which is the highest funding we've had um, with our state parks um, in years. So uh, there was a commitment there to our environment. Our governor has shown um, that being a conservative is about conserving uh, mother nature and taking care of the environment. I have two children. I grew up fishing. My great-grandfather was a commercial fisherman. I want to uh, them to be able to enjoy our waterways just like uh, I was able to enjoy whenever I was growing up. And I think the commitment's there from our governor and I think the commitment's been there from the delegation to work on these smaller projects to make sure we have clean drinking water and we have clean water in our area. Speaking of, fit, oh, uh, I'm sorry. Just to dovetail off that, I think the most exciting program for water quality um, was a shift this year. Um, in years past, we've always done uh, septic sewer programs by individual project basis. Uh, this is the first year we've committed significant funds, hundreds of millions of dollars to DEP for a septic sewer grant program. Um, so while we didn't get uh, the project that we asked for funded, uh, the only reason it wasn't funded this year, like it was last year between Senator Broxton and I for the ECUA, 
um, is because the DEP is now going to start administering a grant to award septic sewer projects based on county rankings to make sure that that money is being used, not necessarily for the most politically astute politicians, but for the, the most uh, needed areas around the state by county. Um, so we will have separate sewer money coming to the county in the future, and the county is prepared to start ap applying for that money uh, very soon. Very good. Jeff, uh, I, oh, go just one of the things that happened late in session is that uh, we received the stimulus from Washington. Mm -hmm. The state portion was $10 billion. Uh, frankly, at the, bit, at the end of session, we were almost in budget which was unprecedented. There's really only two other, one other state, Texas and Florida, and that's because we valued people that work and have businesses, and we wanted them to, even in COVID, to be able to operate. So our sales tax were pretty strong. Uh, real estate is booming in Florida. We're seeing a lot of transition from northern states that were treated different than Floridians during the COVID, and uh, they're looking at, the, the nation's looking at Florida as an example of how to run an economy. So this money was never designed for Florida. It was designed for those states that are in deep, deep trouble, California, Illinois, New York, uh, New Jersey. And, but being the third largest state, we got a portion share of that. Rather than spending the money, we, we're saving it and we're gonna use it for legacy, for environmental projects. We, we set $2 billion aside for transportation we're going to have a robust septic sewer program that will be introduced next year. These are all non-recurring legacy projects that we will not have to fund in future years. But since the uh, government was so uh, uh, frugal with how they print money, they sent us a lot of it, and we're going to spend it in ways that other states do not, and that's to spend it one time, take care of the project, and get back to the people's business of uh, spending what they give us to spend. Mm -hmm. Speaking, you, you mentioned fishing a few minutes ago. A gentleman uh, sent a question in asking about the Pensacola Beach Fishing Pier. He says it's still damaged from Hurricane Sally. Is there anything that can be done about that? Uh, so uh, I've, I've discussed this with uh, Commissioner Bender as well. Uh, part of that's going to be due to the FEMA and insurance claims that they have. Um, it's not a state-maintained pier. Um, so, uh, you know, the state has funded a lot of repairs. Uh, I know that in Big Lagoon State Park, uh, I know in Johnson Beach, there, there are different things going on the state's funded. Um, but that pier is largely going to be managed by their insurance claim, their FEMA claim. Speaking of insurance, that's a huge deal. <laughs> so what happened during this legislative session relating to homeowners insurance and windstorm and flood and that type of thing? In other words, citizens. We're looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we did not do everything we should. We definitely, we know that uh, everyone listening that owns property has seen dramatic uh, rate increases for homeowners, and that's driven by, by claims that we've never seen before. If you see all the roofs that are being replaced at, from Sally, it's unprecedented. Well, some of those roofs should have been replaced because of the storm. Many of them were simply aged out and the insurance companies picked up the bill. Well, that is gonna be passed to the consumer because they, an insurance simply is, is like a bank. They collect money and redistribute it in claims. So we have, we have problems in Northwest Florida. They've got big issues in South Florida. And we have uh, 28 domestic carriers that are in serious, serious trouble. Uh, they're running loss ratios of 150%. And I don't know many businesses. You deal with uh, stocks and bonds. I don't, you wouldn't recommend anyone buy a business or invest in a business that's losing 50% more than they take in in revenue. And if we don't deal with that issue, uh, we're going to be accountable to the people of Florida on why we did not solve the problem of some of these bogus claims that are just rampant across the state. And most of the claims, a uh, statistic that's incredible, Florida represents 3% of the property market and 70% of the litigations on how to settle claims for property. So it, it makes no sense that we're in balance on our values, but we're out of balance on litigation. And we've got to deal with those issues in future legislative sessions. Okay, very good. Here's another question uh, about sports gambling. Uh, what can you tell us about initiatives regarding sports gambling and will this have any impact on the panhandle of Florida? In other words, Northwest Florida, where we are. 
I mean, we had a special session where we passed a gaming bill. Um, there is um, some sports booking in that bill. I imagine that will go to the courts, and that's something we'll have to wait and see what happens from there. Okay. Any other commentary? Uh, I think the uh, the the funniest kind of comment that was always asked is, you know, where's your closest casino? When we went to the special session to, to ratify the governor's uh, compact with the Seminole Tribe, and the closest uh, casinos we have are in Biloxi and across the border in Alabama. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, overall, this the our compact doesn't change uh, necessarily how people gamble in person, um, but the, the folks that are already betting on their phones on, on, on sports um, will now potentially be able to do it legally, and some of that revenue will actually go to the state instead of these offshore bank accounts. Um, you know, it will be challenged in the courts. Uh, there's a question about whether or not hosting a server on uh, Seminole land uh, would qualify it, um, or whether or not this would be an expansion of gambling under the Florida Constitutional Amendment. Um, we'll let the courts decide, as well as the Department of the Interior, uh, IGRA, um, and uh, I can't wait to find out. <laughs> okay, very good. Here's an issue that's been getting um, a fair amount of discussion, and uh, rightfully so, recently is homelessness. Uh, the viewer is asking locally some new steps are being taken to reduce homelessness. Did the legislature take any measures to address homelessness on a, a broader scale? To your knowledge, anything along those lines? I know that we had some state funding for special projects for homeless shelters and for uh, mental health and, and things that a tribute to homelessness. Um, we also did a lot of stuff for veterans, uh, specifically veterans rehabilitation centers, veterans um, housing and things like that uh, in special projects that I saw in the budget. Um, I, I think that's more of a, a micro issue where it, it falls under the, the county and the city, not that the state can't be a good partner in that, but um, th th those are smaller projects. Uh, I, I know that I didn't do anything personally. I did a mental health um, special project where I funded a mental health facility, but um, that was specific to mental health overall, not for homelessness and in general. Anybody else? Okay. No, there you go. Okay, very good. <coughs> Pardon me here. Um, <coughs> excuse me. A good question come up, huh? Yeah, <laughs> apparently so. <coughs> you grab a drink of water. <coughs> Pardon me, please excuse me. <clears throat> what is your view on why the legislature has made it more difficult to push through citizens' ballot initiatives with stricter campaign finance requirements? So somebody's going to have to answer that while I clear my throat. <laughs> oh, I mean, well, somebody else Excuse wants to me. jump on it. Um, I think the best example is we had uh, in the, the same uh, election year where we had a, a felons voting rights pass, and we were tasked with an implementing bill to try and figure out how to accommodate that. We also had Marcy's Law pass, uh, which was uh, victims' uh, rights in those same circumstances. Um, we've seen examples across the country where very well-heeled, multi-billion dollar um, uh, investors come in um, and they, they pay uh, to have petitions collected for their kind of pet projects to kind of end run the legislature in a lot of circumstances. Um, and our constitution uh, at the state level <clears throat> is I think 10 to 15 times larger than the U.S. Constitution, if not more so. Um, uh, and that's not a, a way to govern a state, um, especially not when you have outside influences coming in, uh, funding pet projects that aren't necessarily aligned with what our voters actually care about on an annual basis. Very good. Um, so uh, making sure that that's just more accurate, uh, more consistent with the true intent of a voter initiative uh, was something I think we all value. Got about four minutes. I, I want to, this is a good question. I want to get it in real quick, and then I want each of you to have a, a final word. Why are landlords not required to have liability insurance in the state of Florida? Anyone know about that? Take it away, Doug. Well, I don't. I don't know if that's a broad statement. I I yeah. think if they have a mortgage, they probably have a package that includes the property and liability. I don't know if that's uh, really a correct statement. Mm -hmm. uh, it have, must have some. Uh, special circumstances, but I don't know of anyone that has any assets that doesn't have liability. Yeah. And I would, I would go as a, when you rent a property, you're, you're in possession of that property for the term of that contract. You are the person that essentially almost owns it in fee simple. Um, we have renter's insurance for a reason. Um, so being responsible for that's going to be governed by that contract more so than anything else. Um, and uh, I'd have to know more about the context of the question, like Senator Broxton, to give a better answer. 
About two minutes. I, mean, I just want to go around the table here and have uh, everyone kind of close out. Just kind of, you know, what are you most optimistic about as we plow through the 2021? And uh, Representative Salzman, I'll begin with you. Sure, I'm most op optimistic about the safe walkway study. <laughs> my, my folks up here know how passionate I am about that. You know, we, um, I came into the session with a, a mission to fix safe walkways for children um, going to school, to and from school and for pedestrians <clears throat> in general and um, made it through the House, didn't make it through the Senate and uh, somehow or another uh, got in good graces and convinced the speaker to fund the, the study and so I'm really grateful and excited for that. The study will be finished by September of next year and then we can write legislation that actually coincides with what that study is. So that's my favorite. That's what I'm Great, I got two minutes, so uh, give me 30 seconds. <laughs> there you go. I, I'm really excited about water quality and aquaculture uh, initiatives. I think we've learned a lot about this thing called PFAS in the past few years. Um, there are some really good opportunities in this next legislative session, especially with having two um, uh, chairman of appropriations committees here on this table and a third in Senator Gaynor um, to really uh, maximize our influence and, and impact. Oh, and, and appropriations share Trumbull in the Florida House. We got two on each side. Um, there's a lot of opportunities to maximize our influence and make sure that we're bringing home money to the I'm thankful that I'm not going to have to carry my religious institutions bill uh, again because after three <laughs> years it finally passed. It's been run six or eight years and helps people who don't inadvertently break the law when they carry concealed uh, to church on Sunday. Um, so I'm glad I'm not having to run that bill. We're going to look at appropriations projects um, over the, the course of the next <laughs> couple months. But honestly, I think I'm just so excited to finally feel like a delegation we have that's hitting on all cylinders and I look forward to the, to the future for Northwest Florida. Senator Broxton. I, I, I don't want it to be a sour note, but I think all of our viewers are concerned about the country and the direction we're going, and they want to make sure Florida stays Florida, and that all this in invasion of uh, new revenue and uh, businesses replanting here, that uh, they don't, they take the values that they are running away from and don't bring them back into Florida, and that's keep uh, a robust economy that allows people to earn a decent living. Uh, enjoy quality education and quality of life. And if we can do that, then we've accomplished our goal of being good legislators. Well, thank you so very much. It was wonderful to finally get to see all of you in person again and welcome aboard. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Representative Salzman and uh, wow, what a year. Last time we did this program live was in January of 2020. So uh, wow, how things have changed over time. Lady and gentlemen, thank you so very much. Again, uh, can't express our, our thanks enough for you joining us this evening. And also a special thanks to you, our viewers, listeners, and constituents. We appreciate your questions. Our guests this evening have been members of the local Northwest Florida Legislative Delegation. Senator Doug Broxson and Representatives J.R. Williamson, Alex Andrade, and Michelle Salzman. Senator George Gaynor and Representative Pat Maney were unable to join us. Tonight's broadcast has come to you from the Gene and Paul Amos Performance Studio over the television airwaves of WSRE-TV, PBS for the Gulf Coast and radio station 92.3 FM and AM 1620. This program will be online soon at WSRE.org and also on YouTube and Facebook. Thanks so very much for watching. I'm Jeff Weeks. I hope you have a wonderful evening. And hey, by the way, have a great spring and summer and enjoy all the sunshine state has to offer. <laughs>